Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this edition. of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. My name is Erica Hammond, and joined with me today is Kathy McElroy, president of SEIU Local 580, here to talk to us and tell us a little bit about their victory at DCYF. Thank you for joining us, Kathy. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's start from the beginning with the good news. Okay. Um, you guys just received 20 new positions that will all become, they'll become 20 new 580 members. Correct. Can you tell us a little bit about the impact this has on clients and 580 members? So um, I think I think the impact is is hopefully going to be um, big. We have a um, a little bit of difficulty right now with some with retention, mm -hmm. um, and and I think that's normal in any agency where you kind of nickel and dime it, where you get one or two additional staff mm -hmm. to then people are leaving at a similar rate. So there's really no actual relief felt from the workers. Okay. So I think this, um, an influx of you know 20 new frontline staff positions, mm -hmm. plus we, we do have to fill some vacancies there as well. So um, I, I think that'll have a, a big impact. It'll certainly um, be a good morale boost for the staff. Yeah. Um, they've been working under a tremendous amount of pressure um, for quite a while now. Um, and I think for the families that we serve, it will actually allow them time if mm -hmm. if we can get those caseloads down it will actually allow the workers time to spend with the families right. getting to know them and getting to know the children that they're responsible for as opposed to you know just mm -hmm. putting out fires all the time and, and really doing only what they have to do right. um, because there's simply not enough time in the day I mean, being able to have that type of relationship with your clients in a position like that is critical. It's too. it's absolutely critical, and it and it's and it's really healthy for the families, right. because a lot of times we can, if you can build that kind of relationship, mm -hmm. we can get those families out faster, right. where they don't need the department to oversee, and we've helped them work through you know whatever um, struggles that they're facing. Absolutely, and. Can you tell us a little bit, what is your opinion on, why do you think it is that the soon-to-be former director at DCYF was refusing to admit that the uh, department was understaffed? So I don't think she can admit that if the mm -hmm. governor, unless the governor agrees. Mm -hmm. And so if the governor does not admit that we had a staffing crisis mm -hmm. um, or that we were understaffed, I think the director takes her direction from right. the governor's office. And, and I think it's very difficult to go against that right. um, because she can be removed, right. you know? Not that, I mean, obviously she wasn't removed, but, but that's a possibility. So right. I think there's a fear that you, you know, you, we have the same message from the mm -hmm. governor and the, through the director, through the, you know, administration of the department. The only people right. with a different message were the members and a lot of the families that we serve. Right the really important voices. Correct. Explaining. Correct. Um, and why do you think it is that lawmakers are so opposed to um, funding, properly funding the department? So not all lawmakers were opposed to that. Right. In As this particular, thought. in this right. last budget, um, the Republican caucus and some of the progressive Democrats actually voted um, with the union to, to add more staff um, to the department and to do a line item in the budget mm -hmm. for uh, 25 adif additional positions. Um, that did not pass because mm -hmm. the majority of the, um, of the House didn't, um, didn't see the value of that apparently. Now, you know, I've since spoken to some of them and I, I think there's some um, feeling that they'd like more of a explanation of where the money goes. Mm -hmm. And and that comes down to the budget and the FTEs. I mean, you have the, the budget gives you a certain number of positions that you can fill. If you fill some of mm -hmm. those or, or a, a decent portion of those at a higher right. pay rate, you're not filling the frontline positions. So 
they have the positions that they need, but they don't have, or they don't have the positions they need because they've used right. it in other areas. Okay. There are, you know, if, if we, and I'd be certainly happy to do this with anybody who wants to do this, we mm -hmm. could go through the organizational chart and, um, and kind of get an idea of where, where we could cut. Right. And, and administrative staff, and not even administrative, non-union, higher up staff. We have eight, epi six, I think, at the last count. Somebody told me eight, but I haven't seen eight. Epidemiologists in the department. And epidemiology is the study of, you know, diseases, blood diseases, that kind of thing. So they're supposed to be studying the statistics and data analysis in the department. But we have three data analysts that work for the department. Right. So why are we hiring eight additional people to give us information that we mm -hmm. already can get? Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the things that I think where we can look at, hopefully, you know, the next director coming in will have an eye for that and say, okay, maybe we don't need this and we can add, you know, four CPIs because we didn't get any child protective investigators in this particular um, you know, give back with the 20 positions, their right. social workers. Look to where the voices of the families and Correct. the workers are saying that we really need to be right. staffed, right? And that's, I think, one of the things that, um, you know, my, my people took a no confidence vote in January. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason for that was because they didn't felt like their voice was heard. We have some some um, people with a lot of experience in that department, mm -hmm. years and years of institutional knowledge. They know what we've done, what we haven't done, what we should try, what we shouldn't try, why mm -hmm. it didn't work the first time, and what we need to do differently going forward. Mm -hmm. And so I think you need to tap into that. That's really an untapped resource mm -hmm. in that department. Right. I wonder if that has an impact too on the uh, turnover rates when someone sees something happen so many times or sees something not work so many times. Yeah. It's I tough think to stick around. It is, and I think it's demoralizing for them, and they they feel beaten down. Oh yeah. Um, you know, we they have been working what I consider at what I consider a staffing crisis for years. Yeah. Um, you know, the national best practice for social work is um, is 14 families, 28 children. I don't. I don't think, other than brand new people who are still within their six month probation period, mm -hmm. I don't believe I have anybody in the 14 families range. Wow. You know, and, and at, at the State House last week when we went to oversight, mm -hmm. one of the workers um, went around the room before he went up to speak to take the numbers, like how many cases, and most of those people were 19, 20, 21, some even more. Wow. It's scary, and it's scary for them if they feel like they can't what, what if I miss something? Right. What if something bad right. happens? That's heavy. That it, it's very heavy. heavy, yeah. And it always seems like DCYF is a department that always either just barely gets by or gets a, a drastic cut in funds when the budget is finished. Yeah, right? there's a reason for that. Yeah. Children don't vote. Right. So, <laughs> so, no, seriously, social services are generally yeah. the, the first line of defense if we want to cut, if we need to plug a hole in, in the budget someplace. Mm -hmm. We, um, you know, the lawmakers generally look to that because it seems like, you know, oh, X right. amount of million dollars for that budget. It seem, well, I don't see any proof of why they need it because thank God that you don't need the services right. that that department offers and that you don't need to be, you know, part of their clientele. So that's a big part of the problem. Exactly. I think so. And do you think that the funding for these positions will remain in future years or will this be a continued fight? Uh, I think it's going to be a battle every year. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some support from um, corners that I didn't expect it from. Right. Um, uh, you know, the Republican caucus was really good. I've spoken to some of them individually. Um, and I think we'll have to just keep fighting. Right. Um, and I think that the staff, the amount of staff that we got is, you know, we got 20, 20 frontline positions, 23 total, because three of them are for Council 94. Those are also frontline staff, which, which do, the more that they do, the um, less that, you know, okay. is put on the shoulders of my workers, or they mm -hmm. step in and, and help um, in a lot of things. So I think it'll be a constant battle. Right. I do. Do you think these newfound supporters will be there to back you? 
lifetime I hope comes. So. I hope so. Right. I hope so. Yeah, and I hope we can gather a few more, right. you know, from from the Democratic mm -hmm. side. Um, in addition to the, you know, the kind of progressive caucus and the Republican caucus to be able to, we really need um, a, a mandate yeah. in the House and in the Senate to be able to um, get this department functioning the way it should be. They need some stability. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to add staff so that those caseloads come down, mm -hmm. we can retain people. You know, we have a retention problem um, with not just brand new workers, but older seasoned workers who mm -hmm. are really discouraged that we're not making any progress. Right. Um, and so, you know, once we do that, we can bring some stability to, I mean, the staff needs stability, but also the families need stability. Absolutely. They need to know um, that their workers are there for them, which they are and right. they try to be. Um, and that if, um, you know, the struggles that they're facing, that we can help them with that. Right. Have you sat down and talked with the governor yet about this? Have you relayed some of this frustration that you're hearing from your members, from the families? I have. Um, and I think that, and, and obviously, the, I believe the director um, finally did have that conversation with her as well. And, and that's why we got 20 additional right. um, positions. If the governor wasn't on board, we would never have gotten those. Mm -hmm. um, so we appreciate that immensely. Um, and I, I think I did, you know, I did, we did, we talked about a lot of things um, that I'm not, you know, at liberty to go into, but, but I do think that we're all on the same page. Yeah. We all want the same things, and that's a stable department mm -hmm. that can help families in crisis mm -hmm. and children and protect our children. Right. And in order to do this, in order to rebuild or have the confidence from the public and from families and your members um, in this department to have that confidence in the department. What are some of the ways, what do you think needs to be done to shore up some of these deficiencies? So, so uh, the staffing definitely will help. Yep. I think we need a new director, uh, you know, a new director that's dedicated um, to the department that um, is going to be in it for the long haul. Invested in it. Invested. Yeah. I think somebody who um, has been maybe either brought up through a social service agency who mm -hmm. um, has some good ideas, we need to take the politics out of it um, mm -hmm. when we're choosing and, and allow that person to, to do whatever they need to do for the period of time that we have them there because, um, you know, when it's a political game, mm -hmm. it's um, the children and the children and the families and who suffer. Uh, are the ones who suffer exactly, right. and the staff obviously. But that's a byproduct. Right. Well, that seems like you still have a lot of work cut out for you guys, I right? I certainly do. <laughs> yes. Um, is there anything on the radar for 580 that will be either continuing this fight or anyone watching things that can be done? So, no, we don't have anything planned mm -hmm. um, specifically. Um, I try to, um, if the members want to plan, a, you know, a rally or um, a lobby day like we right. did at the State House, I try and let, um, you know, have them notify um, the, as many people as they know. Right. Um, I'm not really good with the, the press part of it. Mm -hmm. So this time, Nicole helped me, uh, Nicole O'Loughlin helped me a uh -huh. lot. Um, and she did press packets for me and, mm -hmm. and got them out. So I think we'll continue that kind of a thing. Nice shout out, 11.99. <laughs> yeah. um, that's that's awesome. Was there a good turnout for the rally? Yeah, there was. A, was you know, people work. Yeah. So it's a little bit difficult when the legislature comes in at five for them to get there ahead of time. I had yes. a decent. We had a decent amount of people good. beforehand. Um, at the oversight hearing, the main room was packed, mm -hmm. and um, and I had a lot of members. The, the ante yeah. room was packed as well. So awesome. yeah. And I think sometimes people forget you can still do written testimony even if you can't show up. You can exactly. still write letters to your senators, your yes. representatives. And you can, or you can give it to me if they have testimony right. at the next one that they want me to submit and I will submit right. it for them. I'm we'll always have your, there. We'll have your name and your yes. contact yes. <laughs> running along the okay. route. Okay. All right. Well, we're just about out of time. Okay. I want to thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for having me. Thank I appreciate you. it. All right. Um, well, thank you for joining us, Kathy, and thank you all of you for tuning in. Uh, you are watching Labor Vision. We hope to see you back here again next week. My name is Erica Hammond. Thank you. Have a great night.
Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney. We're very fortunate to have a strong relationship with Beacon Mutual Insurance and over the last couple of weeks we've been working with them to identify some real issues around health and safety and this particular show is focusing on heat related illnesses. Now everybody can relate to that at this point because of the number of consistent days that we've had with high humidity and high heat and for those of us that work on the inside it's this kind of day we're saying thank goodness I don't work outside in construction. It's really important for us to understand issues around heat related illnesses and the impact that it can have on workers who are outside each and every day. With our guests from Beacon Mutual, Mike Whitaker and Dave Cookson, we're back again to talk about that issue. And, and I think it's really important for us to say that although we all want this nice warm weather during the summer, it can result in some real concerns about heat exposure. Why should we, we both know why should we should be concerned, but I, I get the impression that like more than 40% of the heat related illnesses fall within the construction industry. That's a reason for concern. Yes. Why should I be concerned? Because heat related illnesses can be fatal. And every year there's dozens of workers that die as a result of working in the extreme heat and humidity. Um, 40% of those, were, as you mentioned, are just in the construction industry. That's a high percentage. So in 2015, there were 37 deaths as a result of heat-related illnesses. There were more than 3,000 other illnesses, non-fatal illnesses, as a result of working in high temperatures. And some include construction, but it can be landscaping, it can be manufacturing. If you're working next to, say, a very hot furnace, and the ambient temperature outside is already 95 in high humidity, um, what you're being exposed to is much higher. So while we all like to enjoy the beach and we think, oh, it's a nice beach day, well, we also have to take care of ourselves when we are working in those warm, humid conditions. So other areas that we have to look at are restaurants, um, as I had mentioned, landscaping. So there's many different industries that we have to look at to, that are exposed to heat-related illnesses and injuries. There are more than just a general, more than one category of heat-related illnesses. Um, we've had some discussions and they're kind of broken into three categories. What are they? So the first one that you have is heat cramps. Um, and then you have the heat exhaustion and then you have heat stroke. Heat stroke is the one where somebody has, I mean, they have collapsed and it's basically due to exposure to the temperatures. Um, something like that is a medical emergency, you have to call 911 right away. There's no trying to move the person into the, into the shade. Uh, if somebody collapses as a result of being, working in the sun, um, being exposed to high temperatures, they need to be taken care of right away. So some of the programs that are out there, what companies need to do is they need to train their employees to recognize some of the risk factors. They need to recognize what are the precautions that they should take. Uh, I think if anyone has gone by a, a baseball field or a soccer field when it's warm out, there's quite a few players that have these little things that they drape around their necks when they come off the field. They're little cooling towels. Well, I was talking to a neighbor just last night. He said he has two of them that he takes to, to work every day. He's an auto mechanic. But twice a day, he takes it out, uses it to cool down. That's one way he can cool down. So there are quite a few risk factors, and um, I'll let David talk about the different risk factors that we face. Well, some of them are some of the risk factors, Bob. You know, scientifically, we're talking about radiant heat, we're talking about dry heat, we're talking about humidity, and it, it, there, there are actual sensors that you can use to determine all of this, and it's, it's beyond most of us, frankly. Uh, OSHA and NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, have combined to come up with a heat app for your phone. Uh, it's free, it's easy to use, you can't miss it on your phone. It's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a little picture of a sun with a red background. The beauty of that app is any one of us uh, can, can, can basically launch that app and in a matter of seconds, based upon where we are, using GPS, the app will tell us basically what the risk factor is right now and also what it's anticipated to be during the course of the day. Uh, that app is, is, is a wonderful tool for employers looking out for their workers and for workers looking out for themselves and for their peers. Uh, the app also gives you signs and symptoms. 
you know, Mike, Mike mentioned and we talked about, you know, there's starting with sunburn and then and it's the obvious one, right? And then heat cramps and then heat exhaustion and heat stroke. That app's going to walk you through all of that. And most of us know what a sunburn looks like. That's pretty easy. But when we start getting into the, what's the difference, you know, a heat cramp is really an indicator that you're dehydrated. Once we get beyond the, 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 the obvious of, of sunburn, what we're looking at are, are, are heat cramps. And, and all of this is a result of dehydration. It's a result of overexposure, overexertion. Once we get into uh, um, uh, heat exhaustion and heat stroke, we've, we've gone beyond the sunburn, we've gone beyond heat cramps, we've, we've gotten to the point of a true medical emergency. So if we can emphasize anything today is you don't necessarily have to be an expert in understanding the signs and symptoms. And by the way, that, that OSHA app that I just mentioned will help you do that. But you have to understand if someone is dehydrated to the point where, they, where they're suffering from heat exhaustion and or heat stroke, it's a medical emergency. Heat stroke in particular can be fatal. So the fact that someone is, 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 is sweating, as you had described earlier, uh, someone's sweating to the point where they just can't stop sweating, they're feeling nauseous, they're feeling lightheaded, they're feeling dizzy, that's, that's really the most common one. And most of us understand we would need to take that person and move them to a cool area and take active cooling measures. But it's also a medical emergency. We need to call 911. We can't just rely upon those measures we're going to take to have the intended effect. You want to rehydrate the person and so forth, but dial 911. With heat stroke, basically what's happened is your body has stopped producing perspiration. And the person suddenly, instead of being pale, clammy, sweaty, the person, their skin basically turns, turns a, a pinkish color, a reddish color. It's dry, it's warm to the touch. That's beyond a medical emergency. The fatality rate for heat stroke is anywhere from 20 to 40%. So the fact of the matter is, again, dial 911. You needn't be so concerned about understanding what the individual signs and symptoms are. Just know that you need, you need help, you need to call for assistance, and take active cooling measures. Move the person to a cool area, start cooling them. Uh, some of the things you may have to do, you may have to remove some of their clothing. You may have to sponge them down with cool towels. You, you can put them in front of a fan try to rehydrate them, anything that you can do at that point is going to provide And that's some. just an interim, because you've made a phone interim. call by that time. Absolutely, absolutely. Why are some people more susceptible than others? Because beyond just the construction industry, and I, you know, we were talking earlier about how some people on a construction site on a very hot day are working outside for an extended period of time when they really shouldn't be, but it's about getting the job done. Well, the funny but, thing about um, I'm sorry. Funny thing about heat injuries is once you've had one, you're more susceptible to it. So we all think of acclimating ourselves. You know, we we uh, we vacation in Florida perhaps during the winter, and everyone worries, oh, it's going to take me a while to get used to the heat. When so we all know about acclimation that as we introduce ourselves to warm climates and hopefully the warm weather doesn't just come upon us overnight, we can sort of get used to it and get used to working in it. Once you've suffered a heat injury, you're always more susceptible. It never goes away. So that's something we have to be aware of as well. The other factors, I can let Mike, Mike address those if, uh, if you would. Those are wide ranging. So it could be that the person's age, it could be their physical condition, that physically they're not able to work in a warm environment. Um, it may be the lack of air movement. If you're working in an area and there's no air movement, if it's uh, stagnant and there's high humidity and high temperature, um, your body just, everything feels wet. You're not able to cool down. So internally, everything is going to heat up. Uh, there's multiple risk factors that people will face. If someone is wearing uh, personal protective equipment, they're on a job site and say that they're also wearing a, a respirator, uh, they're wearing a Tyvek suit, you know, what's the ambient temperature, and then you're putting a suit on top of that plus some type of a respirator, your body's working that much harder. So there's... Yeah, ironically, the same personal protective equipment that's protecting you on the one hand can also make you more susceptible. So we're not advocating that you not use the personal protective equipment. You just have to be aware that it's going to make you more susceptible. Well, it is a dichotomy. I it often is. think of you know police officers who are carrying 45 pounds worth of stuff on their belt and yeah. a bulletproof vest underneath that shirt, and it's 95 degrees out, and they're on the street. Exactly, exactly. So what employers, though, should be paying attention to is looking at the employee saying, is there something we need to do different? Um, maybe we start the workday earlier. And some organizations will do that. They will start the shift earlier. They may start at five o'clock instead of waiting until nine o'clock so that people aren't working through the heat of the day. Um, 
The one other saying is water, rest, and shade. So make sure people have plenty of water. Employees need plenty of water to drink. Uh, they may have to take more frequent rest breaks so that they can get that water and then provide them with shade periodically. And utilizing those types of preventative measures, if employers can train their employees to be aware of uh, risk factors, um, what may be existing with the employees and what to do, they can prevent these heat-related illnesses and injuries. And you know, interestingly, there's no OSHA standard on heat. Uh, and you would think after all these years somehow that, that would be the case. It's actually not the case. There is no standard. There's no OSHA offers guidance. They offer the app. They tell you how to, how to, how, how to prevent it from happening and how to treat it and so forth. But uh, there is no standard. So if an employer is looking to OSHA or looking for a reason to do it from a compliance standpoint, it's actually covered under the general duty clause which basically says all employers must provide workplaces free from recognized hazards. So there's not a standard, but there's still a mandate to protect workers. In, in an environment, say a construction environment or somewhere else, um, are, are there any regulations around something as simple as making sure there's water available to the employees on a construction site? Again, general duty clause will say yes. So everything's covered under that general duty clause. It would be a best practice but you're not going to find an OSHA standard saying you have to have that. Yeah. And I think it's, under, it's important for both the employer and the employee to recognize the difference between that general duty clause. Not that we all have to be educated to that point, but it, there's almost a common sense factor here. And, and it's the responsibility of the employer to make sure that that common sense factor is in place. Um, it, at a time when it's difficult to get really good employees, because of the unemployment rate or the employment rate, as you, however you look at it, it's important that the employer take a responsibility and say, good employees are hard to get and provide them with the health and safety right. benefits that will ensure that they stay with you for a long time. Absolutely, take care of them. And, and, and even when we, when we drive down the street and we see highway workers who are in the middle of a construction site in this warm weather building a bridge and with all the highway construction going on, it's important that employees watch each other, that it's not just the employer that's always going to see them. Any closing remarks on this particular segment on heat? Just on, on a day like today where it's, it, it's hot but it's not so humid, it reminds you of uh, if, if you're in the desert for the first time, you have to be reminded to drink because you're not perspiring. So there are just as many heat illnesses and injuries on days when you're not sweating profusely as there are on days when it's hot and humid and you, you, you recognize on those days, I'm losing a lot of fluid, I need to rehydrate. On those other days, you, you're still sweating, it's just evaporating so quickly that people don't often notice it and they don't often hydrate as well. So if the temperature is hot, you need to hydrate. One other thing I'll add is on our website, beacommutual.com, we have a, some safety alerts. One of them is on Beat the Heat, and it walks somebody through what they can do to help prevent heat-related illnesses, uh, as well as other um, seasonal type of safety alerts, whether it's a hurricane planning guide, severe storm planning. There's things on there that can help the employers get through this hot time. Thank you for taking the time for coming in again. I look forward to some sessions in the future that we get to have a conversation about common sense health and safety on the job. Absolutely. Um, I think it's important that we um, recognize the good work that Beacon Mutual does, that oftentimes it's not that it's just an insurance company, it goes beyond that. It's the, the public service that you provide, the education and training that you provide, and the support that you provide for both workers and employers. Thank you for watching this segment on Labor Vision. I look forward to seeing you again. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.